Let's pray. Father, we, we ask that you help us to understand your word. We thank you that the creator of all things, both living and unliving, cares for us. And we ask you to help us to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading for today is Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Merlin, I invite you to come up and I ask for God's blessings upon you. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure to be with you all here this morning. I've heard a lot about Boyertown Mennonite Church from our neighbor, Mary Ann, our dear friend, and uh, Grammy to our little dog, Moses. She's good at uh, making friends with most of the dogs in the neighborhood, even the ones that misbehave, and she helps set them straight. I also bring you greetings uh, from the believers that gather at Peter Becker Community Chapel there in Harleysville. It's a Church of the Brethren Retirement Community. Uh, and I am the Director of Pastoral Care there, along with one other chaplain. And uh, Debbie and I are members at Souderton Mennonite Church. I grew up in the Souderton area, and my connection to Boyertown which seemed very far away, was mainly through the radio station, which back then was WBYO. Now it's, I guess, WBYN. And besides hearing the broadcasts on the radio, um, I was connected to it through my uncle, Paul Myers, the builder, who built the station uh, building. And also my dad um, owned Ralph's supermarket and advertised on WBYO. And I think we even had a, a store just for a short time up here in Boyertown that we tried out and uh, found that it was better to just focus on one store in Lansdale. I also was connected to this church through, as many people in the past, Alan Castetweiler, and attended the wilderness camps several summers when I was growing up. And who can forget Al's big booming voice? Uh, and I uh, had a wrestling class in high school at Christopher Dock in Kenton. His son, Kenton Detweiler, was in my class. And I remember him being a pretty formidable uh, challenger when, we, when it came time to wrestle. All that said, I feel connected to this congregation in, in various ways, and I'm delighted to be with you all this morning. In my work at Peter Becker Community, I often sit with people as they are making a transition to a new stage in their lives. And it can be both sad to say goodbye to some aspects of life that we valued and will miss, but also exciting as we anticipate 
what the next stage of life, the next chapter in our lives is going to bring. And I understand that you are kind of in a similar place as a congregation, as you are um, between pastors and kind of assessing where you're at and where you're going and um, what the next chapter of your life is going to be. So I thought this passage from Ephesians was fitting as we consider who we are as God's children and what he calls us to be. And the title of my message is Forward in Faithfulness. So I believe Paul's uh, letter to the Ephesians can give us some good bearings as we are finding some points of uh, reference on our journeys. And Paul wrote this letter from prison near the end of his ministry. He had spent three years at Ephesus helping get this little church, this little body of believers started and established. And it was at a strategic spot in Asia Minor, um, both geographically and politically. And the church was mainly Greek and Roman, which is to say Gentile. There's not much Jew, Jewish uh, influence there. And the life of the city, both socially, religiously, as well as economically, was tied up in the worship of pagan gods. So they stood out as a very uh, a bright light, I guess, and a contrast to the, the broader culture around them from which they had come. Now, Paul spends the first half of his letter in this long prayer of thanksgiving to God and uses that as a springboard for how God, how God's children will respond with their lives. When you know who and whose you are and the story that you belong to, your actions will follow. Now, our passage picks up at the end of this prayer where Paul has just returned from one of his bunny trails, uh, talking about being called by God to bring the good news to the Gentiles. And we pick up at verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. Now, this is an easy part of the passage to pass by in this long river of words that can be the Apostle Paul, but we need to take notice that there is a revolutionary truth here right at the beginning of his declaration that our foundation, the foundation of our life in God is that we belong to an all-loving creator. We are familiar with the passage from John 3.16, for God so loved some people, no, all the world. There is no human who is left out of God's loving embrace. And as image bearers of the loving creator, we are called to join him in his unfolding salvation story. Now, the idea of God being the father of humans was not uncommon in Paul's day. Greeks called Zeus, the god Zeus, the father, father, in the sense that he was the source of all the other gods. He was the greatest of the, the pantheon of gods and of humankind. But then the Romans, they called Jupiter God the Father. But there is a difference between paternity and fatherhood. The God of Jesus is approachable and nurturing, and he even stood in contrast to the God of the Jews, which they also called Father. But Jesus called this God Abba, Papa, a very intimate term, a uh, a term where you could picture yourself kind of climbing up onto God's lap and being held and knowing that everything's okay and you're loved. So starting with Abraham, God said, walk in my ways and I will guide and protect and provide for you. I will both bless you and use you for blessing. Through you, the whole world is going to be blessed. I will use you to write my salvation story and my plan to restore humankind and all creation back to its rightful place. Paul is telling the Ephesians and us that through Christ, we continue in the steps of faith and in the salvation story that God is writing through us. The best story that the world has ever known. Now I'm wondering, have you ever thought about your life as a story? And if so, what kind of a story are you telling with your life. Donald Miller, a writer, um, wrote a book that was quite uh, popular, Blue Like Jazz, 
And someone came, to, they said, you know what, we want to do a movie that's based on your life. And they came and camped out at his apartment for a while and tried to get the story from him. And they said, well, to make a good story, we're going to have to change it a little bit. And that's what, to make it more interesting, to make it something people will want to watch. And that got him thinking, wow, what kind of a story am I living? Doesn't God call us into a, a compelling and exciting uh, page-turning kind of a story. And so he wrote another book uh, called A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. And he observes that our life will be better or worse, significant or insignificant, depending on the story that we choose to live. Now think about your favorite story or your favorite movie, right? I think of, we read The Lord of the Rings to our daughters, and then when the movies came out, that, came out, that was great because we could see what they did with those stories and see it come to life. But if you think about some of those kinds of epic stories, it's like it's the life and death and there's you know, always some new wrinkle in the plot and they have to overcome obstacles and you don't know if they're going to make it, but somehow you, know, you keep taking the next step and you get there. Now, most of us probably don't live lives like that and maybe we don't want to, but there are certain things in our lives that... Um, God invites us to participate in that will make for a compelling, a compelling story. So a good story needs a character who has a, a clear goal and a desire that is noble and larger than themselves, and they have to be willing to make sacrifices to reach that goal and navigate the conflicts that arise along the way. Now, many of us, if we look at our lives as a story, we might question whether we are living a very compelling or satisfying story. Perhaps we're plodding along the path of least resistance, satisfied with a comfortable but unremarkable life, one that does not ask much of us. Now, Don shared this whole concept with a friend of his who was having trouble with his teenage daughter. She was spending a lot of time with a loser boyfriend Her grades were going down in school, and Joe had tried to kind of give her the pep talk or pull her in and to no avail. And after hearing his friend Don's idea that we live our best life when we're living in the right story, he decided his family needed a better story, one that shifted their gaze to something bigger than themselves and a cause that required sacrifice and would require that they all pull together using their each of their own unique abilities to reach their goal. So Joe acted decisively and he took out, he took a risk by taking out a loan to help build an orphanage down in Mexico. And you can imagine him coming to his wife and saying, "Um, I need to tell you something. He, He broke the news to her about taking the loan and wanting to build this orphanage and uh, told his daughter and said they were going to need to make some sacrifices in order to help make this happen, and they would all have to do their part. So his daughter grabbed onto this idea. She loved this, and she wanted to help the children and took up the challenge, and she even traveled down to Mexico on her summer break so she could meet the children. She took some pictures. She, uh, being a young person, she had a website that she could, you know, tell other people about what they were doing and have the, show the pictures and fundraise. And then his wife was coming up with ideas of how they could save money at home to help pay for the school. Now, the next time Don and Joe got together, Don asked him how his daughter was doing, and Joe shared that things had never been better. His daughter's attitude was positive, her grades were back up, and she no longer felt a need for a boyfriend who only dragged her down. Not only that, his relationship was with his wife after the initial shock of her hearing that he took out a loan without consulting her, had never been better. She had a new respect for him now that he had shown how committed that he was to lead their family to a better place. So, the story we embrace really does matter. Am I a person of worth? a beloved child of God? Am I empowered to make a difference in the world for God? When we know God as our heavenly Father, who loves and cares for us, we are drawn into a life of meaning and promise. So here's the question. What story do you want your life to tell? Your individual story? Your family story? Your congregation story? 
When I talk to residents who are looking ahead and making plans for their funeral services, they often tell me, I want a gospel message to be given at my service. And my response is, well, guess what? Your life, your life is the most compelling gospel that your friends and family will hear and see because they have front row seats. They see how it really works, how it plays out. Um, Tell me your story of faith and how you lived out your good news so that I can share that at the memorial service. So you don't have to have a rock star testimony. You just have to show that you lived your convictions and that the love of Jesus made a positive difference in your own life and in the lives of the people around you. Living God's story often leads to conflict and sacrifice. Now, the Ephesians, they lived in a culture that was centered on the, go- the goddess Artemis or Diana. And you may actually remember um, Paul got in trouble when too many people came to the Lord and the silversmiths in the town were losing business because nobody wanted those idols of Diana anymore. And so there was a riot because of that. So sometimes, you know, what we do does have an impact and we have to deal with the consequences, but it's all good because it's all for God. Now, Diana's temple in their city was considered one of the seven wonders of the world, of the ancient world, and much of the commerce in the city was connected to her notoriety. For the Ephesian believers to join Paul in bowing before the Father, the God of all creation is in direct defiance to all that that city stood for. Our present-day adventure into God's story will also lead us into some rough places as well, but that makes for a good story, and we see how God comes through for us. If we are striving for a good and noble cause, there is always sacrifice involved. In verses 16 to 17 in our passage, we read, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. We're going to go with the the love idea here. There's so much in this passage, but let me tell you about Henry Nouwen, he has described finding our life in God as a choice between living in the house of fear or the house of love. Our culture seems structured to feed our fears. We watch what we call the news, which is mostly just a review of the world's most violent and corrupt and depraved happenings and the powers that be bumping in against each other. And... um, you know, they say, if it bleeds, it leads. So we're all seeing all of the worst things going on in the world. And that daily recitation of bad news um, leaves us feeling like our world is going from bad to worse. It's like the far side comic I saw. saw. There's two people in this big hand basket, and the one is saying to the other, uh, where are we and what are, where are we going? And so anyway... Don't know if you get that, but I like far side. Before the 2016 electoral election in the U.S., there was a poll taken of people who lived all over the country in various cities and towns, and they were asked to rate the state of affairs in our nation. And without exception, people said, oh, it's going from bad to worse. It's not good. And then when they were asked to rate how things were, how life was in their own community, they say, oh, it's all good here. Well, you can kind of imagine if you're asking everybody everywhere, how is it? And everybody says, oh, it's bad everywhere else. Something's not quite right. It seems that most people are seeing the world darker than it is. I guess we have the media to thank for that. So now one observes that when fear pervades our lives, we are living in the house of fear. And from there, we look out on the world. And what we see from that perch of fear is alienation and scarcity. Those with power and influence often use fear to foster inner tension and divide us from one another. And those who can make us afraid can also make us do what they want us to do. Fear is one of the most effective weapons in the hands of those who seek to control us. It could be a father, a mother, a teacher, a doctor, a boss, a bishop in the church, or God. 
As long as we are kept in fear, we can be made to act, speak, and even think as slaves. Nowen concludes, the agenda of our world, the issues and items that fill newspapers and newscasts are the agenda of fear and power. So if we are living into the story being written by our Father, the all-powerful, loving creator of the universe, then we will step out of fear and into love. <clears throat> For as we read in 1 John, perfect love casts out all fear. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is that they are strengthened in their inner being with the power of God's spirit and that they be rooted and grounded in love. When our attitudes and actions are informed by love rather than fear, our lives are going to appear very different to those who are guided by their fears. Back in verse 10 of this chapter, Paul says that the church is called to make known to the powers of this world the wisdom of God. When we are growing forward in faithfulness, loving all people unconditionally as God does, the world will take notice. In 1942, in Americus, Georgia, Koinonia Farm was founded by Clarence and Florence Jordan and Martin and Mabel England as a demonstration plot. Uh, I'm taking this from their website. It's a quote, a demonstration plot for the kingdom of God. For them... This meant an intentional community of believers sharing their lives and resources, following the example of the first Christian communities as described in the book of Acts. I noticed in Sunday school we were looking at the book of Acts. So we, uh, interesting that you could have a group that said, you know what, we, we like this model, we're going to try it out. So there, there they are in America's Georgia, in the heart of the South, in the United States, uh, living a communal lifestyle <clears throat> in an integrated community, um, and so you can imagine, that made some waves. So other families soon joined. Visitors came to the farm. They were invited to serve a period of apprenticeship in developing community life on, uh, on the teachings and principles of Jesus. And act, incidentally, Clarence um, Jordan was a New Testament scholar. He uh, specialized in agape Greek and ha even has a translation called the Cotton Patch Gospels where he translates... Uh, some of the Gospels into the Southern vernacular. But the Koinonians shared not only their faith and resources, but their work. They farmed their land for their livelihood and sought ways to steward and conserve it. In fact, the, the farm that they bought, they only could afford a really run-down uh, farm with poor soil, but they, they worked hard and they got it uh, going. And... Um, they emphasized from the beginning the brotherhood and sisterhood of all people. They worked, prayed, and shared meals together regardless of skin color. And their commitment to racial equality, non-resistance, and economic sharing, as you can imagine, brought bullets, a bomb, and a boycott in the 1950s as the KKK and others tried their best to force them out. They responded with prayer, nonviolent resistance, and a renewed commitment to live the gospel. And they also, some of you may not know Koinonia Farms, but you know Habitat for Humanity. When Millard Fuller joined that community, uh, he was a successful businessman and lawyer, and he realized that he got to the top of the ladder, but it was leaning against the wrong wall kind of a thing. And he said, you know what? I'm a committed Christian. Let's try this uh, avenue. And then he was the one that conceived of Habitat for Humanity. Um, so uh, their, their community was a call to embrace living in a house of love rather than a house of fear and alienation. Many times, looking through the eyes of love rather than the eyes of fear means that we are stepping towards certain people when others are stepping away. In 2017, I worked with a committee of residents at Peter Becker Community to have a series of meetings called Learning to Know Our Muslim Neighbors. This was at a time when there was a lot of suspicion and fear being stirred up related to Muslims. So there was a lot of interest on the part of the residents in learning more about a faith and a people that they didn't know very much about. Uh, one of the Mennonite churches in our area, uh, Salford, they actually had invited a couple they knew from Harleysville to come and speak to them when they had done a similar kind of a, uh, a teaching or educational event. And so I had heard about this and I... We had two educational meetings, a, a video and a time for conversation around the tables 
uh, to help us kind of get up to speed. And then the third session we had was this couple from Harleysville who had lived there for 50 years who were Muslim and a delightful couple to get to know. And they came and we got to ask them questions and find out more from their perspective, which went over well. And the series went so well, we had such a good response that people said, hey, we don't want to stop here. Isn't there a mosque down in Lansdale? Let's see if we can go visit them. So we contacted them and uh, they graciously provided a meal for us. And uh, the group went down, 40 of them, to share uh, a time of discussion with them. Living in the house of love opens up our hearts to others, even those who others fear and see as a threat. Love gives us the eyes to see the image of God and all his children and opens our hearts to even our enemies through our shared humanity. St. Francis of Assisi had a fear and an abhorrence of lepers. One day, however, he met a man afflicted with leprosy while he was out riding his horse near Assisi. And he was already kind of on his journey of faith, trying to um, get closer to Christ and realizing that Christ was found in the, the poor and the afflicted. And though the sight of the leper filled him with horror and disgust, Francis got off his horse, approached the leper, embraced him and kissed him as kind of like welcoming him as a, as a brother and overcoming his fear. And out of the leper put out his hand. This reminds me of our Sunday school lesson this morning. We were talking about Peter and John at the temple. The hand was out asking for uh, some kind of handout. And uh, out of compassion, Francis gave him some money. But when Francis mounted his horse again and looked all around, he could not see the leper anywhere. He had just disappeared as if into thin air, and it dawned on him that it was just, he had just encountered Jesus. It was Jesus whom he had just kissed. Verse 18, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul underscores here that we plumb the depths of God's love as we journey together. Habakkuk Mennonite Church in Lancaster was an older church that was declining in membership. Their church dramatically changed when one of their families was asked by a local Church World Service representative to host a Christian refugee family from Burma, Myanmar, for a couple nights. They said, just, just for a couple nights. We're really desperate to have them. We've got to have them stay somewhere. And this older couple, I think they were in their 80s, had done this in the past. And they said, oh, we're too old for that. And they, but, but, you know, they had an open house. It'd be like Mary Ann, right? She's in her 80s, right? You have, what, two extra bedrooms at your house? Anyway, <laughs> I'm glad we're friends. I get to pick on you. They reluctantly agreed after being approached several times, and the nights actually grew into weeks and months, and as a result, the church learned about the plight of the Karen people who have lived in a country at war for over 60 years. These Christians had fled across the border of their country into Thailand and struggled to survive while various groups fought an extended civil war. The Karen people were in danger of being completely wiped out as the conflict continued, and uh, the Christians were particularly vulnerable. So with the help of Church World Service, more families started coming to Lancaster, and Habakkuk Mennonite Church found a new calling as they helped them settle into the community and they welcomed them into their church. They alternate services spoken in Karen and English, and they are learning from each other as two cultures find common ground in their love of Christ. You can imagine the church potlucks are a little different now. They get to sample a greater variety of food. Um, and the Karen refugees are finding a new life in the U.S., and the Habecker Mennonite Church has found a new life as they are learning to see the world through the eyes of their Karen brothers and sisters. And some church members who were questioning their faith or the relevance of church have had their faith and their sense of calling renewed. 
Two groups of believers with different languages and culture are learning how much richer life can be when we come together and we share our stories and journey together. When Habakkuk Mennonite members prayed that God would revive their congregation, they did not expect that their answer to that prayer would come from halfway around the world. They did not expect that they would be learning a new language and culture, and they did not expect that they would be filled with so much love and life so quickly. Verses 20 to 21. Now to him who, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations forever and ever. Amen. The last several years, I think, have been a very difficult and discouraging time for many people as we've dealt with this crazy pandemic and virus and other things. But even Christians now have been challenged to explore new ways of how we're the church. I talked to various pastors and um, a lot of more people are choosing to tune in. We don't see as many people present and welcome to those of you who are tuned in this morning. We have the same thing at Peter Becker. I went from about 50 people on a Sunday morning to about 25, but we still are printing about 140 bulletins, so we have people tuned into our in-house TV channel. So we're being stretched and challenged to think about what does it mean to be the body of Christ and how we do church. I want to offer a story here as we uh, think of our calling in Christ and the, the ways that God uses us. In 1935, a biologist from Washington State found himself drifting down a river in Southeast Asia on a dark night when he was amazed to see a mangrove tree burst forth with a brilliant light for a few seconds and then go dark. Now, he's out in the middle of nowhere. It's not like somebody put up their Christmas tree lights early or anything, and he cannot figure this out. He could not believe his eyes. How could this happen? Then three seconds later, it happened again, But this time, all the mangrove trees up and down the river lit up with it. Dr. Hugh Smith was the first Westerner to experience Asian lightning bugs. They had an ability to synchronize their flashes during mating season. He wrote a scientific paper describing the phenomenon, but the scientific community, as you can imagine, had a hard time accepting that tens of thousands of lightning bugs had the capacity to synchronize down to the millisecond. Besides, what was the benefit to that? Wouldn't that just make it harder for the females to select a mate? Years later, after much study, it was determined that in the dense mangrove trees, the chances of a female finding a mate went from 3%. I don't know how they figured this out, but they did. Went from 3% if the male lit up alone to 82% if the males worked together. In fact, the collective glow of the synchronized fireflies can be seen for miles around and attracts even more lightning bugs to add their light. So I believe this is a lesson for us as we seek to shine God's light in the world, right? By ourselves, it is easy to feel ineffective and to become discouraged in the face of the darkness and the need that is all around us that we see every day. But God has given us each other and called us to work together as the body of Christ to tell his story with our lives and to be as we are part of the family of believers. So in conclusion, forward in... Oh, I missed one thing yet. I want to tell you something from uh, Galatians 6. Um, The Apostle Paul, who was no stranger to hardship... Shipwrecks, beatings, almost killed by stoning, imprisonment, uh, illness, said, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So, in conclusion... Forward in faithfulness means affirming the value of ourselves as, as God's children and, and all people and our calling to serve in his name. 
It means committing to follow love's lead, even when it leads to the unclean and the enemy. And it means walking the way together, trusting that God will do far more than we ask or, advent- ask or imagine. Let the adventure begin.